You're listening to The Dental Guys, real world prosthodontics featuring Dr. Connor Casey. We bring prosthodontist Connor Casey on the show to discuss where pros is now and where it's headed. We're gonna discuss life as a prosthodontist in a small town versus a big city, which is better. And then we're gonna get into some clinical topics you won't wanna miss. He's gonna answer questions that will help you know whether what you're doing now is working or whether you should be changing it. It's all coming at you right now on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And Wes, 2020, just keeps on just punching. Can it and you get just, over? I'm it's done. It's body shots. It's body shots. And like I yeah. feel like I'm finally like, ugh, ugh. And you mm. know, the latest casualty of 2020 and the Rona is what it's done to meetings for this next year. So we've been talking about all the plans we had for oh, the man. next six months to a year. And I mean, what are we going to do? John, here what are we going to do? I mean, man. virtual is all virtual. I'm spending a lot of time on my back porch lately. I get a phone call <laughs> from a friend the other day. <laughs> and, and you know what we were talking about? He was a dentist and you know, I miss like coming back from CE, like feeling just jazzed up, man, mm -hmm. like ready to crush it. And whether you're implementing anything new or not, when you go away and you spend time with people face to face and talk shop and you pull yourself out of your normal day to day routine, man, John, some of the f most favorite times that you and I've had together is when we wake up early in the morning because both you and I are runners. You know, you're running more than I am lately because uh, you're training for some stuff next year if that mm -hmm. happens, you know. But I mean, <laughs> right. I'm typically doing, you know, our normal morning runs. We, John and I would be doing, you know, 5K and we get up early. I miss that, man. I miss getting up and spending time with people and then coming back and feeling jazzed up. So I get this phone totally. call. All right. I get this phone call. From Spear Education, they're like, hey, you coming out to the course? And I'm like, uh, no. I'm like, I got a backlog of patients like from here until next year, you know? Right. And I'm like, how am right. I going to get to the course? And they're like, well, do you want us to just put your credit, credit put it down for next year? And I'm like, yeah, man, put the six grand on for next year's <laughs> CE. But even yep. if that'll happen, John, because we're I hearing, know. there's already been some rumors, John, of like an actually confirmation of CE yep. that's just being turned to virtual. Yeah, stuff. all these meetings that we were going to be like for you and I, we had stuff that we we're going to be speaking at, you know, coming up. A lot of these March meetings are going to be either covering yeah. or speaking at or attending. They're all pretty much either canceled or virtual, including the AO, which we understand. You know, we yeah. understand. I bet Chicago Midwinter is going to be that way. Of course, the ADA convention was that way. And, mm -hmm. you know, this last month and it's just going to continue. And there's no real end in sight yet. You know, we don't know when that time is going to be that we can show up at a meeting, go to a lecture, and then hang out and talk and go and have dinner and drinks and talk about what we learned, which is just so hard. Like I love, don't get me wrong, I've seen some amazing Zoom content. I've, oh, I've yeah. learned some good stuff, and, I'm, and I feel like we're, we're, we're making leaps and bounds in that. But well, there's John, just like we've talked about before. And yeah. a little taste of some next level CE actually last Friday. Just last right? week. Just last Tell week. Tell us a little bit about that because I think that's really some stuff that we're going to see in 2021. Yep. Right? That's going yep. to be just like, oh my goodness, we really need to start moving this way. John, tell us about what you saw. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. So Dennis Tarnow was speaking, and the people that were putting it on, they they did interesting, had an interesting approach. The idea was they were marketing this so the product reps would go to the groups like study clubs or specialists who had maybe a, a study club together with general dentists, and they would put together a room and they would rent the room, mm. and they'd have a TV in the room, a big screen or a projector or something. And so they would simulcast 
the CE presentation, there was a area where you could put questions in for the, for Dennis Tarnow. And at the end, he would answer them potentially. But the, the thing that was different about this than sitting, you know, in your underwear in your basement watching this on your laptop is you're in a room with other dentists, which is what we've always done. That's been the part that's been so powerful. And at the at the end of the presentation or at the breaks, you can still have that interaction in the room with other people. And I'm not going to say it was it was perfect. I mean, I still think there's nothing like the engagement that you get when someone's right in front of you walking around. You know, you're, you're not going to check your phone. You're not going to get have your laptop open looking at the stock market because right. somebody's right in front of you. But I will say that the interaction that we had at lunch and at the breaks, it, it really, it was, it, the camaraderie was there. And I, I definitely see, and they could socially distance the room that way. You know, it wasn't packed and crowded and all that stuff. Mm. So I think that's the future, at least in the short term. And I, and I think that that's, that's a, it's a good way to move. And I think there were, they said there was, you know, a couple thousand people, I think that, that tuned into this around the world. And you know, Wes, I mean, I think that's where we're at. And I, but I still think that it's, I think a lot of us that are kind of CE junkies that are, mm. that we really feel this sense of like, what's next, what's next, what what's next, that drives us forward. It's one of the reasons why this show has been fun to do because we've still been able to kind of engage with mm. listeners about what's next, bringing you guys, you know, these types of interviews and discussions like we're about to have with, uh, with Connor Casey um, uh, that really take this, these ideas and bring them to you in a way that hopefully you can connect and it maybe directs you on what you need to be doing next. Even if we can't even do it in person for another six months or a year. But, but Wes, I, I think that this is, this is going to be, you know, one thing Clark Stanford said from the AO when we interviewed him is he said, this could also be an opportunity because of the virtual connection we're having for you to maybe attend meetings that you would never otherwise attend because you wouldn't travel to them. But because so much of this is available virtually, you might learn things even from different medical subspecialties, from, from other areas that you would never even think about. And it may end up pushing our profession forward uh, uh, in, in a right. new way. I think you're right. I also think that it could be, it could be, if we, if we, we got to think about it another way too, is that there could be such a yearning for us to have face to face get togethers again that we could see a resurgence of these bigger meetings and, or, or we could see the local meetings. You know, mm. where we had like once that state meetings and local dental societies really had just amazing lineups um, like they have in the past. It could be a resurgence of those things. Um, but I think yep. what's here to stay for sure is this virtual model where people will be able to tune in from across the world, no matter whether you're presenting in East Tennessee northern wisconsin or san francisco there's going to be this virtual component that's just built in because of the internet and what it's done for our profession this uh this year so let me just say this is that the dental guys have some amazing things coming up this uh for the rest of the year uh, we're excited about some of the people we're bringing on some people that we have never had on our show that we actually have followed and some things in our practice that we actually have implemented from these people. So right. I'm excited about that, John, that we're going to have some new guests coming on our show. And then John and I are going to continue to bring that classic dental guys stuff like you're going to hear in today's episode we're bringing back whole stay tuned <laughs> at the end of this conversation with dr connor casey from northern wisconsin he's a prosthodontist we're going to bring back the lightning round where we ask him five mm. amazing questions about things that you would be interested in even as a gp like oh what what are you doing about your crowns and the posterior? Well, you just stay tuned for this because it's going to be good. We talk about talk about a lot of things with Dr. Casey. We're super excited. He came on the show. He's really joining us at Restorative Driven Implants to help us out to really raise our level to the next level. So we're excited about that and his collaboration with the dental guys this evening. So stay tuned for this interview after a brief message from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbray with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. Owning your own practice can be very attractive, but business ownership isn't always what it's cracked up to be. 
When you're the owner, you're really never truly off work. You're always thinking about your team and your patients and your bottom line. Not only do you have increased pressure and stress, but sometimes you actually make less money than you could as an associate. Are you really ready to take on the difficult but rewarding role of business ownership? For more information about this and other dental related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, today on the show, we're kind of excited because several of the meetings that we have been able to go to the last couple of years, we've met a lot of residents and kind of newer uh, grads from PROS programs. And we've had a lot of discussions with them about what does prosthodontics look like today? What does private practice prosthodontics look like? And how should they be kind of focusing on, on where to go and what to do? And also, it's been an interesting discussion when we've been meetings like the AO about, you know, what is the place of the prosthodontist in today's world with a lot of restorative dentists, uh, GPs doing some more advanced procedures or at least wanting to learn how to do those things. And around that time, we were introduced to our guest today, Connor Casey, who has been, uh, we kind of got to know him through some things we did with, with restorative driven implants. Um, and now, excited to actually you know get to talk with him on the show he's going to be doing some uh some lecturing and teaching with restorative driven implants in the coming uh, coming years which we're super excited about um and uh, so connor let's bring let's bring connor in to the discussion welcome hey guys thanks for having me really excited to be here really uh big fan of the show and all the things that you guys teach awesome awesome yeah we've we've been it's been really uh, a, a exciting thing to get to uh, to, to have you uh, kind of as a new kind of breath of fresh air with what we've been doing with some things with RDI and just getting to know you. Um, and, you know, we were, uh, we were talking prior to the show about some of the things that they kind of where you've been. So just briefly, uh, why don't you just talk a little bit about, you know, what your journey's been, you know, when you graduated, where you've been, what you've, what you've done in, in private practice and kind of give us, you know, the, the story of, of how Connor, Casey uh, got to where he is today in private practice. Yeah, so I was a 2006 graduate from uh, University of Minnesota. And uh, after Minnesota, I actually worked for two years. I wasn't really sure that I would ever want to do dental, do school again after dental school. I was that guy who, if they had a award for least likely to ever go back, I might have been the guy to get it but you know those two years it was tough you know being out i worked in a in a tough area where the treatment plans that were coming in were it kind of highlighted how little i knew and fortunately my wife who's a physician who was uh, at the time finishing medical school she was going back to residency and uh, she said uh let's, let's get out of here. Let's, let's leave Wisconsin. Let's do something different. And, um, I was very interested in pros and had, uh, met a really great program director out of the university of Alabama at Birmingham and they were placing implants and it was seemed like a program that was very progressive and really centered on, on, on practicing more so than maybe teaching. So I, uh, moved to Alabama and completed that three year uh, fellowship where I was uh, chief resident my last year and then said, Hey, we're, we're going to go to Colorado. Like who doesn't like Colorado? It's kind of uh, every Wisconsin person's dream to go out there to be in the mountains and still be in the snow and maybe not quite as cold as it is here. And the intention was to stay there. Uh, my wife actually was continuing her education in uh, endocrinology and, you know, something about just the big metropolitan area kind of wasn't what we wanted. We kind of want to be back around family. So we moved back, moved back to a kind of a smaller rural town in the northern part of the state. and set up a practice here and um been very very happy to to be here hmm. 
So going from the small town to the big city and then kind of returning back to the smaller town, that's an interesting process. So when you were in, talk about what practice looked like in Colorado and then compare that to what your practice is like now. Like what, what did that look like? What, what, what kind of volume, what kind of size, what kind of focus, you know, procedurally, just kind of walk us through what that looked like. Well, moving to Colorado, we were, I was trying to kind of keep my options open and see what was going to be available. So I, I joined kind of a, like a DSO group with that kind of intention to get my feet wet, meet specialists, meet prosthodontists. I was kind of hoping to maybe join a, a practice. I had met a number of great, spe great pros specialists out there and talked a little bit about moving um, into those locations. Uh, talked about some of the, uh, thought about clear choice just a little bit. And, you know, in the meantime, and while I was working at the DSO, you know, there's a ton of competition out there, uh, having to stay open late nights, early mornings. And in general, like the, that, that practice that I was at kind of started to devolve almost more into a more specialty pros practice for kind of what it was intended. Um, mm -hmm. We started getting bigger cases in. I, I worked with some really great surgeons that uh, were part of it. And um, so it was great, but I guess upon moving back to a smaller town, it was a little bit easier as far as less competition. I could kind of pick my hours. I, you know, I, I would, I would know my patients better, maybe mm -hmm. less volume, but man, I'm still really slammed out here. The one thing that is different is in a smaller area, you just don't have as many specialists to work with. Um, mm -hmm. So in some ways you're kind of a tighter group. Mm -hmm. um, you better get along well, which is fortunately not a, not a challenge at all, but it's, it's a smaller, smaller crowd. Um, I think people kind of knew I was coming into town well before I actually arrived and, mm. and, you know, people were calling me up, Hey, I got your number from so-and-so and heard you were coming in and uh, happy uh, that you're coming. It's, it's nice mm. to have some, a, a well-trained person coming in too. So easier than I thought actually. Yeah. Let's talk mm. a little bit about, you know, I think this is interesting because setting up a pros practice now, you know, and versus setting it up, say, 20 years ago, you know, it's been that, I guess, for for the most part, prosthodontists have been, you know, associated with a lot of universities. Um, and it seems like um, as a educational avenue, like to stay attached to uh, certain oral surgery programs because there's a lot of reconstruction, you know, like we're talking like radical, you know, things that require like someone that's doing these things all the time. You know, you, you, you always like back in dental school in 2000, I always looked at the prosthodontist is like, okay, this person has cancer. They lost half their jaw. You know, and that, and it needs a prosthodontist to actually restore this and figure this out. Or, you know, whenever we were in residency here at uh, University of Tennessee, it was somebody that got in a car accident and lost, you know, massive amounts of soft tissue and hard tissue, and you need a prosthodontist to consult on. But now it seems like that, and I, I don't know the stats, but it seems like that the prosthodontist um, and tell me if I'm wrong, is, is there a move for a prosthodontist residencies to put people out into private practice, like maybe into a clear choice situation, maybe into more of a traditional style practice that has hygiene and has a reoccurring revenue stream and that type of thing where you're building something. I mean, you started from scratch in, in a northern Wisconsin town how is that different than what maybe we thought a prosthodontist was doing 20 years ago? 
But, you know, I think that when you think about a specialist, you know, if, if someone went through an oral surgery residency and we're still doing composites afterward, you'd be like, wait, what the heck's going on here? Something's different. Um, but process is different because how do you really, where, there's kind of a broader scope in the sense that wh where do you kind of pigeonhole their scope of practices? So, I mean, for instance, you know, you could work on a referral basis only and maybe get look for uh, referrals from specialists or you can market directly to patients uh, which I think is becoming a much more popular thing um, you know do you have a hygienist in your office to try to maintain the work that you do so you know I would say that pros faculty you know they want people to kind of be in all avenues they it's they of course they want people in in uh, the university setting, but I, I do think that they want uh, pros people treating patients out in the um, all over. There's not that many of us, and you know, it's the. I think if 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 they get board certified, that's kind of in a way what the uh, what the faculties are looking for with it, but. Um, the, they want more recruiting. They want more people aware of the specialty um, being a bigger deal now. I mean, Do you Frank think that most of your classmates, like tell us a little bit just to kind of maybe give us some stats on that. Mm -hmm. Like your residency classmates, maybe that were in your class or, you know, the years before you or after you, what do you think the percentage was, if you know, that went out into private practice directly versus education versus, you know, say a clear choice i mean do you have a feeling for what's going on in the overall residency situation you know how many people are going out into practice versus you know kind of staying in academia or, or what's that look like my feeling actually is is more are going out to private practice i think a, a large group still does go into academics uh, or like for instance you mentioned uh, maxillofacial prosthodontics you know that's an extra year of fellowship after mm -hmm. the three years of residency so that's even a smaller subset and those people are going to probably have to be in hospital settings attached to universities and you know they're just kind of like a an md uh, within that system and so I think there's that group and there's the group that wants to be in the academic section. But, you know, when I think about the people that I graduated with, two um, probably went into some sort of an academic setting. Um, mm. But I think a lot try to give back. They, they try to, you know, volunteer at a residency, um, maybe a dental school. You know, they're, they're trying to stay in academics a little bit. I, I think mm -hmm. that there's just kind of probably a, a love for academics. You know, when you leave, it's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm falling behind. Like, I got to keep mm -hmm. my foot in the mm -hmm. door ever so slightly. So I yep. think it's just the yep. type of people. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, I mean, you mentioned, you know, composites, right? Because... Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember Prostodonis saying, I don't remember the last time I did a composite, you know, and then, I mean, I just think like, how's that even possible, right? Because, you know, and even going to Spear, you're trained by, for the most part, they're all Prostodonists, you know, and Greg Kenzer, he teaches a composite course out there and, you know, and, and we've learned so much about what's possible with bonding mm -hmm. whenever you apply the right occlusal schemes. So we can digress on that for a little bit, but <laughs> what I would say is, is that, I mean, the cases, you know, you talk about, you know, caseload and you feel like it's, you're busy and, and all those things. Do you feel like that, how long did it take you from starting a private practice? Cause you started from scratch, correct? Right. You didn't buy yeah. a practice, right? You didn't no. buy a book of business. No. You started from scratch. How long did it take you? And have you moved from traditional general dentistry to more of the, quote, specialized practice where you're not seeing as much general dentistry now? What's 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 the mix looking like? Hmm. Well, with I think with my setting, um, it would be really hard. And again, it's hard to to create that. Um, how, how do you how do you name what it, what it means to be a 
pros only specialty. So I would say that if somebody came into my office and, you know, spent 30 minutes just kind of looking around or seeing what was happening, they'd say, oh, this is a kind of a traditional general dentist practice. Um, you know, I, I do work with a lot of specialists, but, you know, there's something about a patient referring a patient to you. You know, not everybody might be the um, foam mouth reconstruction person. And, you know, I don't feel like that's the type of practice that I can have kind of in my area, but I get plenty of things, um, plenty of cases that are interesting, um, that patients say, you know, I, nobody's kind of told me about these things, you know, and I'd say that three years, you, if you kind of know your stuff, you kind of start to see a little shift in the patient mindset, the people that are coming in, mm -hmm. um, you know, specialists are craving for competent dentists. And I'm not saying that the prosthodontists are the only ones out there, mm -hmm. but man, you know, you find a general dentist that knows their stuff that that specialist is just latching on to them. And mm -hmm. so, you know, for me, um, just because I can say I went through a, a fellowship, you know, that vetting process is kind of gone. They, they, mm -hmm. they kind of know that, all right, mm -hmm. he's at least done the work. He's kind of proved himself on mm -hmm. some level. Mm -hmm. They, they seek you out. Um, and it's, and it's kind of amazing just how much patients do find you. Uh, I mean, I have some mm. patients that travel four hours to see me because I'm the closest prosthodontist um, in for mm. a, a four hour radius. So mm. now what do you think yeah. about the move that we've been hearing more about in the last couple of years with uh, prosthodontists taking over GP practices instead of maybe starting from scratch or trying to buy a prosthodontist practice, they're going into a general dentist practice that's retiring and taking that practice over and actually turning that into kind of a, a GP model, but sort of a super GP model where they're using prosthodontic skills that they've learned in residency, but they're also, you know, still having a hygiene program and they're still mm -hmm. doing composites and they're still doing, you know, basic dentistry. You know, are you seeing a trend that way? I guess we've been hearing about that, talking to people at some of these meetings, but are you seeing a trend that way? Do you think, I mean, I guess if you're talking to your, you know, knowing what you've done here, you've, you've kind of seen two sides of this starting from scratch. You've seen the DSO kind of model. You've seen sort of the implant center type of model. You know, how do you compare that to this idea of going into GP practice and kind of transforming that? Uh, first of all, does that, is that happening as much as we're hearing? And what do you think about that? You know, probably as a prosthodontist or a person that has kind of an idea of having a very high level uh, type of practice, I, I would imagine that taking over a general dentist practice kind of presents very similar hardships. Like, for, I mean, when you take over or when you buy a general dentist practice, you kind of are taking on that mindset, or at least you're taking on patients and staff of that mindset of the dentist that left. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a patch them up, get them along, you know, minimal kind of money, I mean, you're going to spend a lot of time trying mm. to re-educate these patients. Uh, you're going to mm. lose probably a lot. Your staff, you're going to have to figure out a way to get them up and to realize, hey, we're going to do things a little bit different here. And and that can be great because you can look at your practice and say, I've got a ton of opportunity here. Mm. Um, but you're going to find some resistance, I, 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 would, I would have to say. It's... Um, you're going to have to figure out how do I bring patients up to a level? How do I make that connection that health is, um, is lacking here? So, you know, I think that's a struggle that a general dentist or a prosthodontist is going to make anyone who, who, who wants something very particular. Um, so can you do it? Are you, are you up to the challenge? If you are, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a really good thing. One of my classmates who's got a very, very successful implant uh, practice, he took over a general, directice, uh, general dentist practice. And, um, you know, six years later, he's, he's doing great. Hmm. You know, Frank Spear took over a general dentist practice, if I'm not mistaken, John. 
and mm-hmm. um, and one of the things that he talks about is that conversion of the patient. You know, um, and you can go back and listen to one of our first podcasts where he talks about that whole journey. Uh, the first time we interviewed Frank Spear. And I, I do think that there is an appeal, right? Because I'm like you, Connor, in that in 2003, I opened a private, or 2004, I opened a private practice from scratch because I had a certain like, like mindset of the type of practice that I wanted to have. Now, obviously, some of those things change over time as we grow as dentists, especially me being a general dentist, but then being exposed to, you know, uh, GPR where we had full arch and that kind of thing going on, but I was nowhere near, you know, it took me seven, eight, nine years to even get to where I kind of had created what I thought I wanted, right? Or what I thought I, I knew I wanted. And John's very similar being that he was able to come into, uh, his dad's practice at, at the time and really build his own book of business. And, 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 um, in a sense of, uh, you know, creating that environment of what you, tr- what you're trying to achieve really in the mindset of a patient, right? Because it is a battle. I think this is with everyone that's taking over a practice. If you're hearing this, it is a battle to change the team's mindset, like that work for you. And then on top mm-hmm. of that, walking into a hygiene operatory, and then you look down, you're like, oh man, this has been reparative dentistry or emergent dentistry like their entire life and they've been here 20 years as a patient and this is this is bad. You're going to have to have hard, more hard conversations than, and it gets taxing, right? It gets mm-hmm. taxing on you, yeah. the team, everyone. So Connor, let me ask you this. As, as a specialist, and i move the show along right here, move to something a little more a little more controversial, maybe. I don't know if it's controversial, John, because it it was for someone like me as a general dentist. I'll tell you, whenever Wes Mullins came out into private practice and he wanted to start placing dental implants because he was trained in residency to place dental implants and he had he had actually put it on the back burner really for a little while. And the, actually, the oral surgeon next door to me, I was going over to him at the time and I was just watching him put my implants in. And he looked at me and he's like, Wes, you need to be doing this now. And I'm like, well, I'm trying to build a book of business over here, right? I mean, I just opened up from scratch. I didn't want to buy all this equipment. And he was like, you need to be doing this because you're telling me what to do, right? And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, you're the surgeon. You just need to place it where, you know, we need to do for the, you know, the restorative part. Long story short, I end up placing implants, but you know how many, how many surgeons, right? Like would not really even like look to me as like, I mean, I had to always prove myself, right? That I can place a dental implant, you know, and I want you to work with me because I can't do them all. You know, I'm not interested in that. Now, I have some similarities there with you because, you know, and John does too, because John's a placer as well as a GP. And there's a lot of GPs listening to this right now. And you're a prosthodontist and you place dental implants and you get referrals from surgeons too, not maybe necessarily to replace, but people that you work with that are, you're restoring their dental implants. Right. How is it as a prosthodontist placing dental implants and what made you want to place dental implants? You know, I wanted to place implants pretty much as soon as I heard of implants. So it was <laughs> kind of right there um, early in dental school. And I just kind of liked that idea of, of doing it. I like the idea of a surgery. And, you know, it's a, it's a fine line for sure. Like, one of my good buddies, uh, he was a very good surgeon. He did a lot of like more advanced grafting procedures in uh, our uh, fellowship and he doesn't place. And when he moved down to Florida, he quickly kind of figured out that he would do better uh, referral wise. Uh, and he has more of that traditional pros practice that you might think of uh, if he didn't do it. So, you know, he works in a building where he's got a, a periodontist right down the, the hallway from him and they work together and he's like, you know, I miss it, but I'd rather be doing this, you know, for, for me, I'd be lying to say if I hadn't gotten a little bit of uh, flack uh, from specialists about placing implants, but 
you know, not not that much. I mean, the vast majority they're here to to help me. I mean, they realize that not every situation is out of a competent person's scope. And you know, when when I need stuff, I mean, the benefit that they know of working with me is I do know my limitations. Like I am not sending them things to say, help me out of this jam, please fix this. Um, they're not going to get that from me because of just, again, that vetting process of, of going through residency, uh, of seeing mistakes. Um, they know um, that, that at least I see those things and uh, uh, I'll be a good referral to them. And when they want to do big cases, I mean, I don't want to place every single implant that comes into my office. I mean, there are plenty of things that I really enjoy punting and say, please take care of this uh, for, you know, one reason or another. And I'm happy to do that. I sleep better at night, not placing every single implant. And I get better results by having them place some as well. So you know, you have to know your limitations. And I think, yeah, you're always going to find someone that might not like to, might not like what you're doing, but is that the type of person you're going to work with? I mean, good craftsmen are always busy. There's always enough to go around. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. That's very true. Now in residency, talk about the implant placement training that you had. Mm-hmm. Because that's, I know, uh, it's part of the, I think it's the code of requirements now for, uh, residencies for prosthodontic residencies to place implants. So it's not like this is a unique thing to mm-hmm. Birmingham, for instance. I mean, this is being taught universally now from what I understand, but is it, is that, is that true? And, and then second, uh, what, what did that look like for you? You know, how much, how much training did you have, uh, comparing that to, you know, what, what a lot of the other specialties get? The, you know, that, that statement that you just made, I don't think that probably every fellowship they're getting to place implants. I think that's, it's kind of loosely um, okay. designed there. It, you know, you might, I might go into a, uh, into my buddy who's a periodontist, we might sit down together and, and we switch seats for a second, you know, where I place that implant under their guidance. I mean, that would kind of qualify as kind of fulfilling that um, that requirement, so to say, you know, with with my fellowship, the program director at the time, he was he was very into prosthodontist placing implants. I mean, we are restoratively driven placers. We know where the teeth are. We have a plan. So if we're going to build the house, we should feel comfortable knowing how to lay the foundation for this. So we, I mean, we placed a lot of implants. Um, I had, I was lucky in the sense that our perio department was on board with this. And Hmm. so we actually had perio faculty coming over. We had implant clinic uh, once a week for kind of half a day. And it was funny because we used to, as new residents, we have we had to sit in the office, and the uh, program director would ask us questions, and of course, questions about the kit, questions about implant placement, and of course, you never ever passed it your first, and maybe not even your second time. You know, it was just the thing. Like I remember one time, he's like, "So, um, how come these uh, implants are anodized these colors?" And you're like. Uh, anodizing uh, you know who knows that that kind of a question um but it was just designed that you would fail and have to go back and uh and have to study your kit more and, and really know it you know pros pieces and everything like that so they they made sure to kind of put us through the ringer a little bit and then you would you would uh, assist you'd start by assisting and and then later on you would get to place your own once you um were, were kind of given the green light um, somewhere probably in your second year you'd be given your green light I'd say quantity was not um, a main focus of it but I would definitely say quality was there without a doubt hmm. Hmm. so you I didn't get that many placements um, I felt really really good about the ones we did do 
Gotcha. Well, that helps to know, you know, because I think they're there, like you say, I have heard that there is a lot of variation between the yeah. residencies and fellowships and how that works. Um, now what, when you mentioned, you know, you said that I don't want to place every implant. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but there are certain ones that I do, you know, I guess I think of prosthodontics and I think the more challenging the implant placement, the more that that restorative, uh, case might end up at your office. In other words, you know, if you've got a, a single, you know, implant, right. For number 12, that is not typically something a prosthodontist quote unquote has to restore, but you know, more full arch, more challenging, yeah. you know, bone situations, things like that. You know, those are things that, uh, I guess I think, Hey, that's what a prosthodontist is, is for. So mm -hmm. does that equate? In other words, are you, are you placing more implants for these more challenging restorative cases that come in to see you, or is it kind of the opposite that you're actually still doing more of what maybe some general pla dental placers would do, where you're doing more of the straightforward single case, one or two implants, uh, you know, abundant bone, uh, you know, not as big of a, of a case. Is that something more that's going to be in your wheelhouse for implant placement? Without a doubt, still lots of single two third or, or, or quadrant areas. You know, there's a lot of dentists that still really don't feel that comfortable about placing implants. Um, there's a lot, uh, sometimes referrals. Honestly, uh, I have a section on my referral sheet that says, do you want to restore this patient? And a lot of times they come back and say, or they'll check it, it's up to the patient, whatever they want. And I, you know, there, there's still a mystery with a lot of dentists because I mean, gosh, even when I graduated school, I mean, I didn't even restore a single implant. And I think, you know, I graduated in 06. That wasn't that long ago. I don't want to think that at least. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you do something maybe once in a while, you know, it's easy to forget about it. Uh, forget about the process of, of doing an implant or restoring an implant, say. Um, with bigger cases, absolutely they're coming through. And I think the ones that come through the most are the ones that are having to make that transition from teeth to no teeth, you know, cause those are the ones that are, maybe we're changing, we're changing occlusion. Um, maybe we're dealing with some TMJ issues or, or, you know, it's just a, a mess where some people just feel overwhelmed and like, I, I don't know where to go with this. And, mm. So a lot of those do come through and I do actually restore a, f or I'm sorry, place uh, a fair number of those. I mean, if there's bone, um, if, if it's grafting within my scope, then I'm, I'm happy and confident to do it. But if, you know, sometimes like periodontal disease, I mean, those, that gets scary. You know, how long mm -hmm. is the, do the bugs stay around? Like, do I want to, we don't know. Person? No, right. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. I like get that yeah. to my periodontist. Like that's great. Yeah. Like that's what that's share what the love. Does. Yeah, exactly. Potential tough that's days. exactly right. how we right. feel, man. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, what a great thing to do to kind of be able to pick and choose uh, what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. That's like a yeah. great thing not, about yeah. like being in control, right? I think that's mm -hmm. the whole thing yeah. here is like, we all know that implants are like this restorative driven thing. And I think that, man, if we could just have a little control, you know, yeah. um, you know, just a little bit, um, I think it just kind of eases, eases the sphincters just a bit and makes, yeah, just, exactly. And that's I mean, something that, you know, seriously. that's, that's nice as a prosthodontist to still have to where you're not the quote unquote be all end all of surgery. Okay. You know, right. you have the ability like we do as general dentists to say, you know, this is outside my comfort zone and that's okay. You know, I'm not, I'm not a surgeon per se where I have to treat every case or I have to feel the mm. burn to treat every case. One other question, we're going to get to some like clinical questions because we, we always love to, to talk about materials and some clinical stuff. But one other question just before we move into that is, you know, you mentioned you're a smaller town. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to prosthodontic residents who several of them, a lot of them listen to this. We've talked to many of them about the show. What do you say to them about the big city versus small town question? What, Great. what are some, you've, you've, you've done both. Um, yeah. now I know you're probably going to say, uh, it depends on what you really want personality wise. I get that, but, but talk a little bit about from, you know, assuming that somebody kind of feels like they know what they want to do from a family standpoint. Mm -hmm. What about the business side? What about the referral side? What about the busyness side, the flexibility side? You know, talk about that. 
how, what would you tell, you know, a group full of residents about what they need to be thinking about when they're, when they're deciding where to open their practice? Well, um, you know, if I, probably the first question, you know, when you're coming out and trying to figure out what you want to do, I'm going to, you know, ask them like, what do you love to do about PROS? You know, do you love, I mean, we all love the restorative aspect and, and, and we all were probably drawn to implants. Um, but you know, how important is the surgical aspect of it to you? Um, you know, because that's going to kind of determine maybe what kind of practice that you have as far as referral versus, you know, or I'm sorry, um, specialty or doctor referrals versus mm -hmm. relying on direct to patient marketing. And mm -hmm. so I think you kind of have to look at those things first. I mean, for me, placing implants was really important. Uh, having that surgical uh, surgical experience, like I just, I really like it a lot and I, and I, and I feel sad not to have it. And so if you're a kind of person that has that, then going to a place, you know, maybe where there's not a lot of competition is kind of a very comforting thing to do just because you can really focus on being something different uh, you can take your time to really develop your practice. I mean, one of the things that I, I didn't do it right away and I really wish I would have is I started setting aside an hour and a half appointment for every single new patient that comes in. And, you know, we take lots of photos, we show them those photos um, it, to really educate them and to educate them on what is happening in the mouth. And, and so taking that time is a, is a very critical thing. You know, not every patient wants that, but almost every patient who gets it appreciates it after the fact. So you can imagine a new mm. patient coming to my practice I say, yeah, I'm going to spend how much time there? And I'm not going to get yeah. my teeth cleaned? Like, you know, and if it's a big city, you know, it's it's click. Like, I'm moving on to the next. Maybe I don't even cancel my appointment. Um, hmm. But in this area, it's like, all right, well, I, I kind of want, I think I want to go to this practice. I've heard decent things that don't have a lot of opportunities. So um, it really helps in that transition that we were talking about before of transitioning your patients. And, and it's not selling them something or it's not, convincing them to do something it's finding i mean everybody really wants to be healthy you know mm -hmm. they want their teeth to feel good um you know finding that common ground and then going back and you know doing co-discovery with patients um it's it's a great thing it's a great way to build relationships um so you kind of get a little bit more freedom so i i would just would not say don't think you have to be in a large metropolitan area to, to really make it as a prosthodontist, because truthfully, how many patients do you think like uh, general dentists say might send me of someone they just don't like, or maybe they're like, man, I don't know what to do about this person. Like, just get them out of my hair, go see this guy down the road. They don't know why they're there. Um, that happened a lot in Colorado. You know, they just they weren't mm. interested from the start, but making that conversion you know, you're always making conversions with, with every patient, you know, whether they're, whether they're uh, referred in or they've, you've kind of marketed directly to them. So it sounds like you really just get flexibility from the small yeah, town yeah. and you yeah. get the ability to kind of be, it's easier. And this is what I've always said, uh, being in a small town myself is, you know, it's easier to define yourself. You know, yes. it's easier to define the type of practice that you want because there's not, 10 or 50 or a hundred other practices that are trying to do the same thing, you know, right. and, and there might be one or two, maybe depending on the size of the city that are trying to really do a, a great job of quality and customer service, that being their focus. But you know, the bigger city you get into, the more people there are that at least are saying they're doing that, whether they are or not, it might just be marketing. Um, but yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. I think that that I can imagine as a prosthodontist where your whole practice is hopefully based upon, you know, the highest level possible of, of care because you've been trained hopefully in that way. Um, it would be something you, you want to, you want to stick out, 
You know, you want to yeah. be unique. You want to you want to be able to define what you do. So, so Wes, I know we've been talking about some clinical questions that we've been wanting to ask Connor. Now we haven't really prepared you for these because we didn't <laughs> okay. think you really needed. I mean, you're a prosthodontist for for God's sake. I mean. Yeah, right. You you yeah. should be ready for these. Like it should be, you could go to sleep and still answer. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask why they anodize certain implants. <laughs> right. I guess we'll have to himself. pass on that one. Yeah, right, we'll right, wait on right. that. Yeah, we'll wait on yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Wes, I'll let you kick it off. Go ahead. Let's let's do kind of the, uh, the yeah, lightning round here. This is like kind of lightning round. We've done this before. We're going to bring it back tonight, right? Yes. Like, yeah, it's been maybe a couple years since we've done a lightning round. And so, um, here we go. Favorite right. posterior crown material. Go. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't do it, man. I can't do it. And that's why oh, you got like, this. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I use them all still. Um, so, okay. yeah, we'll just say gold, right? Oh, oh I knew classic it. cross. I knew it. All <laughs> of the residency directors yeah, right now great. are right. so happy. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's yeah. let's refine that a little bit. Okay. Let's refine that. All right. Yeah. Favorite posterior all ceramic restoration. I am doing uh, a lot of zirconia um mm. in the posterior. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Okay. What awesome. about uh when you're placing those crowns or just crowns in general, uh, let's talk about Emacs. Let's talk about lithium disilicate. Are you bonding it? Are you looting it? And tell us a little bit about your thought process on that. There's a lot of people in this area with uh, subgingival restoration. So it would be very, very difficult for me to be bonding. So mm. I, I do cement, uh, or I'm, I am looting. I, I I really don't see a lot of issues with that at all. I mean, there's been a time or two where maybe a uh, that patient comes back a year or two later and they have an open contact. Uh, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure I checked that, but maybe I didn't. I'll redo it. And when I try to cut that crown off, my gosh, it is terrible. Yep. Oh so, yeah. So I, I feel very comfortable with looting. Yeah, I yep. think that's the thing that's kind of put us, um, honestly, John and I, over the edge as far as bonding versus looting Emacs is the fact that we might have to retreat some of these and cutting off a bonded Emacs crown, if you've not done that yet, if you're listening to this show, we'll get ready to get out <laughs> some burrs. I mean, it's actually yeah. more difficult to cut off Emacs bonded than it is to cut off um, a Zirconia, in my opinion. Oh, All yeah. right. So scanning mm -hmm. or impressing what am i what am i impressing mm, great question yeah right, let's, let's yeah. do let's do bread and butter dentistry here yeah single posterior crown mm -hmm. scanning. scanning scanning yeah i love okay. it okay what about anteriors uh, six to eleven veneers impressing mm. and tell us why I mean, I think you know, I know why, I, but I just want to hear you. Yeah, say. I, I just, I just, I, I just love the accuracy still of the impression. It's, it's too thin. Um, you know, we're dealing with which, with much smaller uh, reductions, and I just think you like. I, I look at the the printed or uh, or uh, milled models. I mean, they do look good, but they don't have the detail that mm -hmm. stone <clears throat> stone and VPS. So no, I, I still, I impress there. With you. What about implants? Yeah. I've been quite impressed with scanning single units or or quadrants. Very impressed with that. I I was really kind of resistant to it, and mm -hmm. man, uh, uh, I, I'm I'm being made a believer. That's that's for sure. I you would have asked me six months ago, and I definitely would have said uh, impressing. Impressing. It's interesting mm -hmm. you bring that up yeah. because the system yeah, that. The system that we're using um, primarily in our office we, and um, one that we use at RDI, um, in the beginning of that, I was interested, you know, interested to know how that would work as well. And it blew my mind because we did oh. double blinded for me. Okay. So what the, we did is we, whenever we were testing the scanning analog for the system, um, I took an impression and I took a scan. And then when I got 
the crown to seat, all these were screw retain restorations, I didn't want to know which one was uh, impressed versus scanned. And, and then I, and basically we did enough. I think I did 20 cases, single unit cases. I mean, that's not a lot, but it was enough to say that, Hey, I couldn't, there was no discernible difference. Like mm-hmm. there was none better than another. Like I'd had one that I'd choose one day and the other one I'd choose it, you know, that it'd be scanning that was better. And then the other one was impressing. So it was, n- and, and of the ones I didn't choose, it was like, I don't want to adjust that contact, you know, so I'm just going to put this one in because the contact's better. It's not like it was way off. But what I have found uh, with scanning, and tell me if you, the, the number one thing that I love about scanning for any restoration, especially single units, is the occlusion. Is that what mm. you've seen? Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just that tooth not being in compression, that little bit of distortion. Um, if you are using a triple tray, like, yeah, the, the occlusion has been very, very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't even have that much. You know, a lot of people say uh, implants and proximal contacts being in trouble with scanning. And I don't know if I really believe that because, I mean, I, I don't think I see a difference uh, yeah, with, no. with a stone model. No. It may have to do with the scan analog that they're using with their system, Mm -hmm. but um, I think or the lab because or the lab. One thing I've seen for sure is the huge difference in lab workflow with I mean with implant restorations in general, but especially screw retain restorations with a Morse taper type system or a very you know deep connection. Um, where there is no slop in the connection, you, you know, your lab has to have their, they have to be on their game, mm, you know, because, yeah. uh, if they're not on their game, then you're going to be in a world of hurt with some of these adjustment wise. Uh, but once you have a lab that is competent at that, now you start to see mm. the advantages I think of scanning. Um, if you don't have a competent lab, uh, I, 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 that's where I think people actually kind of, maybe it's gotten a little bit of a bad name because if your lab is just not really doing a great job with implant restorations in general, I don't know that scanning is going to fix that for you. You know, it's uh, there's a lot more, a lot more to it than that. So talk about while well, we're still on the subject of implants mm-hmm. for a maxillary uh, hybrid type of prosthesis, a fixed restoration, uh, say all on four, all on six in the maxilla. What is the material that you would be trying to shoot for when you're doing your planning? What what is your preferred material uh, as far as the restorative side? Uh, you know, it's going to sound funny, but, uh, you know, occlusion, of course, is, it plays such a huge factor in it. Um, because, you know, I, I still like the, the ability to kind of quickly repair acrylic if necessary. I mean, I've definitely seen, especially in residency, I've seen tons and tons of, of, of troubles with hybrid type restorations with, uh, teeth breaking. Um, I've seen zirconia have fracture issues through with through residencies as well. So sometimes, you know, I have to, to think sometimes like what what can I manage? Um, so let's say if I've got a I've, I'm doing up opposing arches, if I'm doing an upper and a lower hybrid, then, you know, I'm kind of building in some sort of kind of a fail safe. And that usually is going to be some like a zirconia maxillary restoration <clears throat> with a acrylic opposing, you know, that's, yep. that's probably what I like um, mm. the most. I, I've, I've definitely, I like the tissue responses uh, that I see with zirconia. Um, I, I like not having acrylic on tissue if possible. Mm -hmm. So even like when I do my mandibular, uh, hybrids, you know, a lot of times I'm, I'm doing a metal intaglio with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just think that I I definitely see it. They, they, they just clean so much better. Mm -hmm. So, but if, if for some reason, if, if, if I just feel like fracture is is I don't know, you just get these feelings like this person has airway issues um, and compliance. You know, sometimes you, you get into these cases, you know, like you, halfway into it, you realize like, 
man, is this person going to be able to take care of this? Or am I, are they going to wear this splint that I told them they have to? Because of course I've made a ton of splints uh, for bigger cases. And sometimes the patient's like, yeah, I don't wear that. And I'm like saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, all right, how are you going to protect this <laughs> when you're sleeping? And you shouldn't be telling me this because I'm going to be less likely to fix this for no cost. Uh, yep, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, I hate to say it depends, but um, I, I could say zirconia maxillary, um, uh, mandibular hybrids for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a fair approach. I mean, we've talked about that a lot and we, mm. we think that most of the people that we're, that we're listening to and reading about are building a fail safe in, uh, when they're doing opposing arches. I think the hardest is maybe when you don't have opposing arches where it's opposing natural dentition and you're trying to decide, you know, which way to go. And that's like mm. you say, we almost kind of have to get a feel for the case. Like, you know, mm. what's the, occlusal plane like on the opposing arch what's the yeah. what's the you know is this an airway problem do we have parafunctional issues uh high, you know cleansability is kind of another side of it what's my vertical you know that i have and uh you know that these are all things that, that make these decisions really tough uh for sure but it's a good yeah. measured approach i mean i think it's not and that's kind of what uh, you know i I've, I've heard so many times especially in prosthodontic sides i think in general dentistry we don't, and this is, I mean, I think this is a fair statement. We don't often know enough to know why we should be able to say, well, I use three different things. You know, mm -hmm. that's okay to say that. It's not just one right answer. And I think that right. that's something that, uh, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize like everything has its complications for sure. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I think my assistant asked me today, she was like, so cause she's new and she was like, we were talking about PFMs. I was just kind of teaching her and we were doing a crown on a, like a 90 year old and a, she had a bunch of dentistry in her mouth and, and, uh, she was like, so do you do PFMs? And I said, yeah. And I said, uh, and she was like, well, where? And I'm like, so precision attachment partials. And, um, and I said, you know, there's a couple other places we'd use those. And, and there isn't, the more that you get into like these complex care cases where you're managing occlusion, unlike materials and trying to build in failure points, you know, mm -hmm. like build it to fail at the easiest place to repair it. You know? <laughs> I mean, and, right. and, and I think that it's, it's a good, a good thing to, um, to really understand as a dentist, not to get locked into one thing and say that's yep. all i do i mean that's Absolutely. that's bad right. that's bad yeah so it, it's let me really, ask you this go ahead go ahead Expand i was gonna on. say it's one of the things that's kind of made it even hard to like mill in my office just because mm. you know i like like what you said i like to use pfms like pretty much all my partial cases precision attachments or mm -hmm. um, any kind of survey crowns they're i just i don't like PFMs, the way zirconia man. and yeah i don't like the way zirconia looks in, in in a in a survey crown it just no matter what i just yeah we could digress on that too but oh yeah back that's in the a day, great topic I thought, and like thought we, and at yeah, what point with there. the long and at what point with the long span bridge right do you yeah do yeah. you start thinking about oh, yeah. connector size and bulkiness sure. and i mean there's people that are just like, well, it's zirconia. Just they don't even, no. you know, everything goes to the lab is zirconia. And yeah. come on now, yeah. they, like, they, and, and I'm not. It's easy to criticize that, but I think yeah. that there's again, this is where, you know, the 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 world of CE needs to open up to to us more uh, to challenge us on that because there's, I mean, that's a pretty basic thing, and yet it's not sexy. And I think mm -hmm. that's why you don't you don't see as much CE talking about these things that are really very basic, and yet. You guys in your in prosthodontic residencies fellowships, I mean, spent a ton of time on just that, right? Like material I mean, on science, just man. Materials right. and oh, yeah. in the lab and just getting mm. crushed by lab stuff and redoing stuff. I mean, I'm sure you you come out feeling very comfortable with all these different materials. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Ta and even talking with uh, the lab technicians about cases and and having that experience in the lab, it just you know it really mm. opens up avenues for possibilities things that maybe they hadn't thought of either and and sometimes you know they're kind of protecting their restorations too um sometimes because of like they don't maybe not know what you're gonna do is it just uh hey take this impression and and um send it to the lab and have them make the final you know on this mm -hmm. on these implants no i just kind of want to see what's what do i need what what do the right. teeth need to look like and how am i going to make this tissue look right then we can talk about what kind of restoration we're going to make um well to kind of close the show out one more question 
Yeah. You know, you've been through residency and you've set up a private practice and now you're building up on what you've learned. But where does a prosthodontist go to learn, right? What's your mm-hmm. favorite CE that maybe like your next level, this is what I'm doing next, or this is where I'm going next. Uh, talk to us about that um, and what you're doing next as far as CE when everything kind of settles down. <laughs> you know, it kind of broke my heart a little bit. I mean, probably some of the most inspiring, I would say, some of the most inspiring lectures I think that I go to is, is the uh, Fix Academy. Um, just because just the level of perfection that is at that meeting, I mean, how can you not want to raise your game to, to meet that? Um, you know, I love uh, the Academy of Aussie Integration as well. Like I've had a, a little hiatus as far as going just between uh, younger kids and uh, a wife who's a specialist in herself and all of her meetings are in March as well. So sometimes we have to uh, take time. Um, I like going to the American College of Prosthodontists meeting. It's, um, it's great to be there with, you know, kindred folk, so to say. Um, but I, I think um, big meetings are, are, are great. They're great, but um, I do like to get into some of like the more specialized um, meetings where, you know, a surgical specialty just on, say, um, ridge augmentation or, or mm-hmm. tissue. Even if I'm not going to do it, right. um, it's so good to know that stuff. Um, mm. You know, I went to Pat Allen's course. I still haven't done any uh, tunnel grafting, but my goodness, uh, what a wealth of knowledge. And, and it makes yeah. me a better referral yeah, you learn what's possible, right? You learn yeah, what's possible, and it. and how, right. and it yeah. elevates not only your game but the people that you're referring to or you're working with on these cases. You know, it's you, you're you're able to say, well, hey, what about this? I saw this. Is that pot? Is this something that's in your wheelhouse? You know, that's that's a great a great way to go. And I think you know all the things you've mentioned. This is one of the reasons why we connected with you. You know, really quickly when we got to meet you, because you know, I mean. If you go back, if those of you who listen to the show a long time, you know, as we're going through this lightning round, you know, isn't it funny to go through and just hear like these are the things we've been talking about on the show and confirming and walking, you know, you guys through the the literature and through our experience, looting. I mean, how many times have we talked about looting versus bonding, Wes? I mean, it's just these questions that, you know, are are really they sound so they're like basic timeless. and yet they're they're timeless, timeless. and everybody is still struggling with these things, you know, what do we, what type of material do we use? How do we, do we scan or impress? I mean, we've been talking about it for like five years and yet it's still something that is the most bait. You talk to any lab and they will tell you that these are still the questions that they get all the time. It's still confusing to a lot of people. And so it's great to kind of have once again, confirmation that these are the things that you, that you're seeing, you know, the type of meetings you're going to. So, you know, yeah. I think for our, for our listeners, um, if you're a prosthodontic resident, you know, or you're new in practice, you know, this hopefully has been useful for you to um, kind of see what one one guy's journey through kind of you know through how he got to where he is and thinking differently about you know what where you want to practice, how you want to practice, what does that look like, um, and then also for the GPs that are listening to this or the students or residents and and you know doing a general dentistry, you know, this is. Uh, it's kind of cool to know that, um, you know, this is how I feel like the world of like general dentistry and prosthodontics in some ways have gotten a bit closer in the last Mm -hmm. 10, 20 years. And from a standpoint of collaboration, we're starting to see these meetings becoming more collaborative because as say GPs are getting into more implant placement, you know, there's, there's two ways we can go here, people. One is we can just kind of just say, well, this works in my hands and I'm just going to do my own thing. Uh, but that's not how the specialty world has worked for yeah. so long. And I think we could take so much from that. It's evidence-based. Uh, it's, it's, there is, as, as we heard, you know, the other day when I was listening to Dennis Tarnow, he said, you know, there's only one correct diagnosis. There's many different treatment plans. And it's very <laughs> true that, you know, like you might do things differently, but there's only one diagnosis. And that's what we should be trying to figure out together is what's the proper way to think about the case and then, you, let's talk about the, what does the evidence say about what we should actually do. 
you know, and I think that's what special to, specialists have taught me over the years that are doing it right is, you know, there's always, like you said, keeping their one foot in academia. Why is that? I think yeah. it's just because there's always this respect for what's mm -hmm. going on in the literature, mm. the evidence. It's not about just doing what, you, what feels right because that's not what you're taught in your residency. You know, it's, it's yeah. about, it's about what yeah. is right yeah. as best we know. Right. Um, right. So in, you know, in, in kind of closing out the show, if you've been, if you've enjoyed what we've been bringing to you today, if you liked what Connor's, you know, been, been talking about, if you have questions for him, for us, make sure you connect with us on social media. We're on the Facebook, we're on the Twitter, we're on the Instagram and uh, we've got, we're there and we're putting some stuff up all the time. I hope you got to see some recent stuff we put up about some endo uh, stuff. I'm really interested in more feedback on that too, but if you liked this type of discussion if you want to see connor come back talk more with us i'd love to have him back again and really get into some more super nerdy stuff we didn't even really get yeah. to geek out as much as, right. we, as we need to you know i, I mean we this is like before, like the lightning round yeah no no i mean this was this was the nice intro lightning round you know we'd like to get in and do yeah some we need deep to dive stuff. we could really do some deep diving right. with you man yeah. like we did yeah. up there at the surgical time you're like well, right yeah should we be checking <laughs> occlusion on all of our implants again right i mean like yeah should we be putting uh, forceps on our hygiene cassettes again right uh -huh. you know, we're talking about uh -huh. like articulating paper forceps on every hygiene cassette is that something that john and i will be changing in our practice. We're not going to talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Right. It's because a great discussion. It's a, it's a great, great discussion. discussion. And I think too, we'd like to talk more about how you're dealing with coordination and steps, because I know you've done a lot of full arch over the years. You've seen a lot of different approaches to that. There's some interesting discussions. Wes and I've kind of wanted to put into a show about what steps can we skip and how can we skip them? Because there's some mm. things that I know you've seen, and I don't mean skip in a bad way. I mean, how can we combine steps into one appointment in ways that save time? Mm. Uh, talking about things like, you know, using provisional restorations as, you know, our wax rim or as an aesthetic try-in and not having, you know. So there's some interesting discussion we could have on how far can we push? How many appointments can you do an all-on-four restoration in at the minimum? You that. know, those yeah. types of things. Yeah. Great yeah, discussion. That's... Great discussion. Yes. So I got lots of ideas for this. And if cool. listeners, you guys have ideas for what we'd like to bring Connor back and discuss, uh, we'd love to uh, We'd love to have those. Uh, Connor, thanks for being with us today. It's been Thank an you. awesome show. Yes. Yeah. Super fun great. discussion. We definitely yeah, want to have you back. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's been great. So make sure, again, connect with us. We're going to continue to bring you content like this. Fun, exciting, on the cutting edge, always bringing it to the next level. So for Wes, for Connor, I'm John, and this has been another great episode of The Dental Guys.